Right before the break, we talked about changes in the world and where democracy is in this. Now let's focus on Europe. So we talked about world architecture. We talked about our very adjacent neighborhood. And a lot is happening on this continent. Now we have a unique session with amazing guests. So we are going to invite the first two. That's going to be in two halves. The first two is going to be Carl Bildt, former prime minister of Sweden. Honorable Carl Bildt, please take your seat. Federal Foreign Office, Germany. Hello. Uh, Ambassador Mr. Kai Sauer, Under Security of State for Foreign and Secu Security Policy Ministry. Yeah, yeah. Um, here. Okay. Yes, here? No? Here. <laughs> here you go. And Mr. David Horowitz, Mr. David Horowitz is going to be our moderator from the Times of Israel. And uh, thank you for joining us on this panel. We'll talk a little bit about the war in Ukraine. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the impact that this has had in Europe, uh, and maybe a little bit about Europe and Israel at the end. Um, again, thank you for uh, uh, for joining me on this panel. I'm a journalist. Uh, I have um, limited expertise on Ukraine, although I have a claim to fame, which is I interviewed uh, Zelensky in Kiev in his uh, presidential offices in uh, January 2020. And before we get on to the meat, and I'm going to try not to speak too much and let our panelists speak, I just find it astonishing. I don't know if there's a precedent in history for the Zelensky story, that here's a guy who was a stand-up comedian, very smart, played in Israel, by the way, uh, did comedy in Israel, wrote a TV series kind of gently mocking uh, Ukrainian democracy uh, in the way of uh, TV series is in this fictional saga. He becomes the president of Ukraine after he has heard uh, uh, criticizing Ukrainian democracy and finds himself in real life very, a very short time afterwards, the president of Ukraine in a country that discovers that it really... Never mind its democracy being under attack, its very existence is under attack. It's just the most astonishing saga. Um, I don't know how it's going to play out, and maybe that's what we should start uh, uh, by asking you. How do you think, I'll start with you, uh, uh, Prime Minister, um, how do you believe that the Ukraine war is going to play out? It's been going for 15 months now. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any kind of an agreement in the offing. What are your thoughts? Well, the, the easy answer to that particular question is I don't know. Uh, but before elaborating on I don't know, uh, let's go back to Zelensky, I agree with you. I, I, I met him for the first time in the early, f before the first phase of the presidential election campaign X numbers of years ago. And he was a man very much searching for what he wanted to do. I remember we had a luncheon and discussed different issues and his, uh, his notion of war and peace, he thought peace was imminent with Russia. Uh, he did not want to talk about things like NATO. That wasn't on his radar screen. So he had a completely different agenda. Then I met him a couple of times when he was president before the war. To be quite honest, I wasn't overly impressed at that time. I think he had difficulties grasping some of the key issues of economic reforms and others. But then he transformed himself by sort of that particular phrase on the morning of the 24th of February when the Americans got in touch with him and based on, in that particular case, faulty intelligence, said, do you want a ride out of Kiev? And he said, I don't want a ride, I want ammunition. And that particular phrase transformed the entire situation. And he turned into something very different from what, including himself, had seen himself as prior to that. And now he does have transport around, but he still wants ammunition. So in that sense, the same thing. How will it be played out? I will be played out in two ways. Uh, first, obviously, what happens in the battlefield. This is a major war. Uh, I, I think some don't appreciate how big this war is. I mean, the front line is 1,300 kilometers. 
as a long front line. We have a couple of hundred thousand soldiers on each side, a couple of hundred thousand soldiers on each side. How many tens of thousands of deaths we have on both sides, we don't know, but they're different figures, but they are very high. We have five million refugees, which is the highest numbers of refugees any conflict anywhere in the world at the moment, and that is, of course, impacting upon the European economy. We have an enormous expenditure of ammunition and arms. I mean, I don't know, I've lost count, uh, but uh, I think we are in the order of 1,200 and 1,300 missiles that the Russians, cruise missiles, advanced ones, uh, and ballistic missiles that the Russians have tried to sort of take out the infrastructure of Ukraine with since primarily September of last year. We haven't seen anything like that. Then we have also, should be added, the, the declared aim of Mr. Putin is to get rid of Ukraine. I mean, he doesn't, that's, he's explicit on that. And we haven't seen in Europe anything of that sort since 1939, when, when Hitler considered Poland to be something that we could be without and, and launch that particular war. We haven't seen anything of the global scale since Saddam Hussein said Kuwait ceased to, hadn't the right to exist. So it's a very major war, both in terms of resources, death, casualties, and impacts. How will it end? I said one on the battlefield, the other in Moscow. Um, at the end of the day, it's what happens in Moscow that decides how long can Putin carry on getting Russia around a war that even only semi-informed Russians must understand by now they can't win. They can't win. The only question remaining is when and how will they lose? Okay. And what will be the consequence of that? And that we don't know, All but right. that will happen. All right, but that's, you know, that is an answer of sorts uh, uh, in terms of ultimately this is up, it is up to Putin to acknowledge that it, that it can't be won. I, or I the Russian leadership, whatever or, that is. Or whoever If, if, if there is such a thing. Yeah. Okay. Tobias, let me, let me come on to you. Um, from, you know, from a European, but also from a German perspective. Uh, in your, at the very beginning of what you said there, and I, you know, we were all conscious of, of this, on that Friday, that first Friday, Apparently it was over. I mean, Russia was about to enter Kiev, and you know this was not going to last for you know any time at all. U Ukraine was was not going to survive. Well, it has. It was it was pulled together. It proved to be uh, cohesive and unified, and it gradually, because it signaled, because of that first conversation that you spoke about, the world decided oh, actually we can't allow this country to be overrun. But is is that is it sustainable? Will Europe stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes for Russia to maybe reach the conclusion that uh, that Carl thinks they will have to reach? Yeah, for sure, it's an um, it's an estimation, or it's 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 part of the strategy of Mr. Putin that he expects some fatigue in the international community, and 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 the coalition supporting Ukraine. But I think Putin makes one big miscalculation. We are supporting Ukraine for sure for reasons of solidarity and for sure to defend the international rules-based order. The, the miscalculation of Mr. Putin is we are doing this also because of, a, and also as a European I now say, of a German national security interest. If an alternation of borders by force in the 21st century somewhere on this planet becomes successful, it might give a bad example to others to repeat it. So it's in our own interest that Putin loses and Ukraine wins this war because I, I'm totally convinced if Putin goes off the battlefield being incentivized, he might try the same again. Somewhere else in a few years, we, we shouldn't forget that this war started in 2014 and maybe and, and it slowed down, it, 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 it was never totally calm. But we shouldn't forget that. And so I think the miscalculation of Putin is that we are all only doing this for reasons of solidarity. And that's not true. And that's also the reason why also my chancellor says we will support Ukraine as long as it is necessary. And um, I'm speaking here as a representative of a country who does not have F-16. So there, there's no question about if Germany would deliver F-16 since we, since we don't have one. But as Chancellor Scholz also said at the, at the G7 summit, it's a signal to Mr. Putin that we are really honest in that sentence, as long as it is necessary. And if Putin tries to play on time, if Putin tries to put more and more and more badly trained soldiers into that war, 
we will sustain and we will continue. I'm totally with Carl who said Russia cannot win this war. The question is how will they lose it and when will they lose it? Kai, can I ask you um, to weigh in on that, but also um, give us a little uh, sense from the perspective of your country. Um, was, there, w was, was Putin's capacity for aggression underestimated? I think, you know, in, again, what, what, what we said at the very beginning there, uh, the assumption was, you know, do you want to ride to safety? You know, why, why didn't Europe see this coming? Why was Europe not better placed? Uh, could it have been better placed to deter Putin? And, and, and what are the consequences of that shock now? Yeah, we, in Finland, we identify quite a bit with, uh, with Ukraine. Um, president Zelensky, he was visiting Helsinki a few weeks ago uh, to meet with uh, our president and the four, four prime ministers of the Nordic uh, countries. And he uh, himself paid uh, respect uh, to, to Finland uh, defending itself uh, in, in the war 1939-40, uh, in the so-called Winter War, against the invasion of, uh, of the Soviet Union. The difference uh, with our war then uh, and uh, Ukraine war today is that uh, we received uh, uh, very little help uh, from, from outside. Uh, we were largely standing alone. Uh, we had some, some help from, from Sweden and, and others, but not to the extent as, as Ukraine today. So that is the difference, but there, there's a commonality, and uh, the commonality between these two wars separated by, by 75 years is that there's a clear aggressor, which is uh, Russia, and a clear, clear victim, uh, which is Ukraine in, in this case. And uh, I would sec second uh, Tobias Lindner here that uh, our motivation is uh, to defend uh, certain international principles like the territorial integrity and uh, sovereignty of a, of a sovereign state uh, against uh, aggression like, like this. When it comes to the decision-making um, for a you know, future peace, I would point uh, to the differences in, 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 in the systems. We have uh, uh, Ukraine, which is a democracy with the prime minister, president, parliament, uh, vivid uh, civil society and uh, free, free media. So it takes a process uh, to arrive eventually at some sort of a, a decision concerning when it's time to, to make peace. Whereas in, in, in Russia, you don't have these uh, characteristics of a democratic society and where the decision is made by a one man or, or a small, small circle. So uh, I think there's a big, uh, big difference and uh, the responsibility for, for making the steps uh, is, is with the aggressor. Do you think the conflict, I'll ask you, but any of you can weigh in, has it brought Europe closer together? Has it uh, um, given Europe a, a greater sense of cohesion and, by the way, of, of responsibility and a sense of stakes? I mean, a country was about to be wiped out. Well, I mean, the answer is a distinct yes in all of these issues. I, I, I was foreign minister for a long time and different ministers. I've probably been through the hundred meetings of the Council of Ministers of the European Union. And one of the most difficult issues we always had was Russia policy. Uh, because there were fairly profound divisions uh, on Russia in the European Union. Some were more sort of uh, more, more aware of what might happen and some others say not going to happen and uh, you are in the past and whatever. Um, that disappeared on February the 24th. And there has been an amazing, even to me, surprising, amazing unity demonstrated by the European Union. And, and the transformation that we've seen in different countries. Germany is often highlighted. But I mean, you can go to public, you look at public opinion polls in a country like Portugal, which is not a neighbor of Russia or Ukraine. It's about as far as you can get from that particular place, uh, still within Europe. And opinion poll support for Ukraine and for what the EU doing is on Swedish or Finnish levels. Um, so it's been an amazing demonstration. And, and then things have happened that I considered unthinkable. I remember long discussions on setting up some, something called a European Peace Facility. That was highly controversial because it meant that Europe, EU was doing things that had to, we were supposed to finance Af African Union peacekeeping operations in Somalia and those sorts of things. That was very controversial. I'm quite certain... I don't know about the Green Party in 
Germany, if you were against. But, but I, I can see, I, I knew parts in Sweden were against. Now that particular facility, that particular fund, is used to buy ammunition for the Ukrainian army. Billions for buying ammunition for the Ukrainian army. I mean, unthinkable things have happened. And add to that, of course, we've had a significant strengthening of the transatlantic bond, uh, which is important in itself. Tobias, the, the, um, obviously this is speculative, but uh, um, maybe you can shed some light. Do you, do you see things getting worse before they get better? Uh, you know, we talked, we heard about the, the danger of, of some kind of tactical nuclear weapons used by Putin. Is that unthinkable now? Uh, is the supply of F-16s going to be a game changer in Ukraine's favor if we get to that stage? You know, ha ha how vast conflict, vast use of weaponry, in, in millions of people made refugees. Have we, have we seen the worst of it? So, so let me start by adding w one more thing to Carl, and it's not about the Green Party and our behavior to the European Peace Facility. It's, it's about the European Union. You know, the usual discussion, I think, Carl, you, you, you agree when speaking about the European Union, in terms of security policy is, yes, we have to get more efficient. We can uh, support NATO in fulfilling capability. That's a normal and partly annoying discussion because it's, it's, it's the usual narrative. But what we have witnessed... Uh, on February 24th is that the European Union is also a security actor because it's the only body in Europe that is able to to uh, enforce sanctions and sanctions are a part of our deterrence and defense so so not only for that reason but for that reason in special it it's the European Union who is also necessary in terms of 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 defending and deterring Russia with respect to things getting worse you know, it's not my job about about b b b describing horror scenarios. Uh, it's nothing is impossible. It's not impossible that aliens appear here on the stage and take us as hostages. So it's not impossible that Putin one day has the idea to to use tactical nuclear weapons. I cannot say you tell you that the probability is at zero, but I'm totally aware that that the, the Russian military is very skeptical. It's very careful in that regard. That's my first point. My second point is Putin, he's an intelligence guy. He tries to, to destabilize, to test our societies, especially the German society, you know, we just phased out of nuclear energy, is, a, is very sensitive to all nuclear issues, be it tactical nuclear missiles, but also be it the, the, the nuclear power plant in Saporizhia where you can see attacks. So, so I take this, or, or refugees, other things, I take that as part of Putin's game, trying to destabilize, to make European societies nervous. But in the end, you know, he, he, he tried it a few months ago and he didn't succeed. So my, my guess is he will not, not succeed in the future. Do, do you have a read, Kai, on, on what is going on in Moscow with Putin, specifically with people around Putin? Um, is, is he... In any way, is he is he weakening? Is he perceived as growing weaker within Russia? Well, first, let me say that the the Russian aggression has been a, a kind of a great uniter, uh, and it has probably had the completely uh, adverse uh, kind of uh, effect uh, from what uh, Putin originally aimed at. Uh, it has united. Uh, uh, the U.S. Congress, it has united uh, Europe, it has united the, the transatlantic relationship, it has uh, pushed uh, Finland and Sweden uh, to NATO. So a long list of, of events uh, which is weakening the Russian uh, global uh, and regional uh, position. Uh, you mentioned the nuclear arms and their or usage of uh, uh, tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, I think uh, you need to be very careful uh, with that, also from the Russian perspective, because uh, even you know threatening with uh, nuclear arms has uh, kind of a rejection uh, a consequence uh, internationally, globally. You have a reaction from uh, countries which are closer to, to Russia, India and, and China, warning against uh, using the, the weapons. 
the Russian brand would, would severely uh, suffer after after um, using nuclear weapons. And I think uh, it also would mean uh, admitting uh, a defeat in, in, in terms of uh, conventional uh, warfare, which is uh, something I don't think uh, Russia would really like. When it comes to uh, the situation in Moscow, uh, of course we don't have a, an insight into a very pro protective uh, in environment. We have uh, still our embassy in, in place, which has a certain communication with the, with the Russian authorities and with the Russian society. And I think the, what we observe uh, is, is not very positive. Huh? All of you, Europe is not about to try and impose terms, correct? I, I get that from the thrust of what you were saying. You've all said here, right, it's basically for Putin or those who control Russia to belatedly reach the conclusion that this was a disaster and unacceptable and they have to stop. Uh, Zelensky is not in any mood to compromise, that's correct? And, and you, you don't see any, is there a, a mediation role? How does this, again, I come back to that first question. You know, it, it doesn't play out until Putin stops? That's roughly it. Um, Ukrainian society is very determined. Uh, I don't think we have detected a single voice in the Ukrainian debate and in the public discourse saying anything else than they want that territory under control. Uh, are there people who are ready to stand up and say we can't do it, uh, we have to have a compromise? We haven't heard anyone saying that, as a matter of fact. It's, it's amazing. And, and they, are, they are also determined that they will win Realistically or not, but they, they are determined that. Um, so that's, uh, and, and our position is, of course, uh, then sort of not only the European Union, G7, and what is that you can't, aggression is not to be allowed. Uh, that's a fundamental principle of the international order. You can't acquire territory, dismember states. You can't abandon states by aggression. I mean, these are fundamental principles can, of international order. Can I, can I interrupt order. you at, and, yep. and, and be a little impertinent in a polite yep. way? It only didn't work because this guy emerged and, and his nation wouldn't allow it to happen. Europe was not riding to his rescue that weekend. Once they had, had, had gathered themselves sufficiently to show that they were going to put up a fight, then these these wonderful principles came into force, but only because Ukraine had that initial will and strength. Is that not the case? Yes, you can say that, but it happened very fast. Uh, I mean, the decisions on sanctions uh, came very, very fast. I think faster than yeah. any of the three of us would have anticipated, as a matter of fact, In, because that had been coordinated to a certain extent across the Atlantic prior to that, uh, not knowing that it was certain that it was going to be used. And, and my own country to take it, Sweden. I mean, there was sort of hesitancy for a week or a couple of weeks. But then I was abroad at the time, but I was, how surprised I was when I heard that the Swedish government had decided to deliver 15,000 anti-tank weapons. Uh, I didn't know that we had 15,000, I have to confess. <laughs> and by the way, we don't have that any longer. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, so, which was an amazing turnaround by the Swedish government that in the first days say, can't be done. And the same thing happened everywhere. So I think we accelerated faster than anyone had thought was possible due to a very strong reaction of public opinion in our countries. I mean, there's a war coming back to Europe and it wasn't the sort of, I spent a lot of time with the Balkan Wars, but that was for a fairly small scale by comparison. This was big. And, and so manifestly, I mean, obscene, right? It was not, you know, it was hard to find a plausible justification, right? This was outright aggression. This was September 1939 again. And it pushed two of your countries to, to move to NATO in a way that you hadn't before. In retrospect, should Sweden and Finland have been on the roads to NATO long, long before? Did you underestimate uh, uh, the potential threat of Russia? I want to well, go yeah, yeah, yes and no. Uh, I mean, hi history didn't start uh, in, on the 24th of February uh, 2022. We had uh, Crimea in 2014, we had Georgia 2008, and... Uh, you know, in the early 90s, uh, Russia created a number of uh, frozen conflicts around its, its borders. If you look at Russia, it's a country with 14, 14 neighbors. Uh? It has 
a border with 14, 14 other countries. And uh, if you make the calculation, two out of those 14 are uh, or can be considered uh, friendly uh, to, to Russia. It's a country with 11 uh, time zones, uh, a, a tremendous landmass. So the, their claim that uh, NATO is, or the neighbors, or Ukraine is a threat, a military threat to them, I don't think it's, uh, it's credible. Now, when it comes to our NATO uh, process, we have been partners uh, with NATO since 1994, uh, intensified enhanced opportunities part partners since 2014. So we were only a step away from, from NATO uh, until the, the circumstances changing uh, created by, by Russia uh, made us to, to, to choose or, or take the final step and plug in uh, with NATO, um, you know, for, formally, and uh, of course our our membership uh, is a positive step. Uh, but uh, like, uh, you know, I, I, I like the slogan very much. It is not complete uh, without uh, the Swedish uh, membership. Uh, then uh, we have all the Nordic Five, uh, Nordic members or Nordic countries as NATO members, which is a tremendous uh, addition also to to NATO's uh, capabilities. Can I ask you, uh, um, Tobias, from a German perspective, tell us, I think everyone here would be interested, um, given Germany's particular history, how has this brazen aggression impacted German public opinion? What has the German public wanted its government to do? How have you um, reconciled desire to have Germany not uh, um, constitute any kind of potential aggressive military force with the need to help defend a country in Europe and so on? All of that would be interesting for us. Okay, how long do we have time? But uh, let me make let me make a few few aspects, and maybe I'm uh, I'm a little bit simplifying the things. You know, Germany, after its history, for good reasons, I consider our society being a pacifist society, being always reluctant in the use of military power when it comes to deployments within the United Nations, as well as on the issue of defense. I was defense policy spokesperson of my party in the parliament when we had been in opposition, and I can tell you, you cannot win any any electoral campaign uh, debating about security or defense policy. People asking you, why are you spending 2%, why are you not spending it for kindergartens or for schools? And um, that has changed, and also, Many Germans had had, I would say, a naive, a naive imagination of Russia. They have spoken of a certain special relationship or something. Uh, my party was always skeptical. We were always opposed to Nord Stream 2. So that was not such a, such a big move for my own party. But right now, I think there are three lessons learned out of the Russian war of aggression. First of all, we need to support Ukraine for our own purpose to be, as I said at the beginning. Second, we have a certain obligation uh, to the security of our European neighbors, especially for our Eastern European neighbors. That's the reason why we are increasing our investment into the armed forces, why really defense at the core is back. Uh, we are investing, for instance, in ammunition. We are setting up uh, a ready brigade for the defense of Lithuania. You, you know, we have the largest army on the ground in Europe, so we have we have some obligation, some responsibility for security. And the last lesson is we need to have a broader scope what security means. So it means for sure defense at the core, but it also means cybersecurity. It means the resilience of our societies against fake narratives. It also means a good energy policy. I'm, I'm politician of the Green Party. And uh, for too long, people said, oh, protecting the climate, doing renewables. That's some nice stuff for the easy days when you don't have bigger problems. And um, for too long, we have been too dependent from Russian gas. So investing into, into a sustainable and independent energy infrastructure is also part of our defense and our, our, our resilience. Can I ask you, um, with, with your many years of experience, uh, to some extent, uh, this this war, I wouldn't say it came out of nowhere, but it shocked Europe. Are there other concerns that you have um, about uh, potential aggression elsewhere on the continent? Are there concerns that you have about democracy eroding uh, in, in Europe? Where are the other flashpoints that, that worry you at the moment? Well, I think this, is, this one is going to worry us for quite some time. Because even if, say, that uh, Mr. Putin was going to fall under a bus tomorrow, 
uh, or later today. Um, I think that what remains of Russian leadership would be interested in getting out of this war rather fast, but that's not going to be that easy. Because then we have all of the questions of recovery and responsibility and all of those things. I think we're going to spend at least, even under that assumption, we're going to spend 10 years or something like that trying to get some sort of something that could probably be called peace in the east of Europe. So this is going to be a long-term issue. And add to that, of course, um, that we have now opened the door very clearly for Ukraine to become a member of the European Union. That's not going to happen next week. But it's going to happen over the next five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years or something of that order. And that will also cause transformations of the European Union itself in different respects. So, so the, even if the war starts tomorrow, the aftershocks of this particular war is going to dominate us for the next decade or something like that. Are there other concerns? Yes, they are. Um, we still have not brought sort of complete stability to the Balkans after the wars there. The enlargement process isn't completed. There's been a couple of hiccups. That's the law, by the way. But that needs to be completed as well. Uh, then we live in a world uh, which is uh, Africa. Look at the demographic expansion of Africa and the effects that you see that in the refugees that are coming. Uh, or, or people moving anyhow, whatever you call them, across the Mediterranean. Uh, in the Sahel, uh, things are going extremely badly on every possible indicators. The Middle East is our immediate neighborhood. We are, in contrast to Americans and others, what happens here impacts directly upon our societies. Um, so we, we, have, um, we live in a fairly volatile environment, to put it in those terms. I just want to highlight one thing you said there early in that answer. So this is really one, one man's war, as far as you can tell. He falls under a bus... They will want. There is. There is. That's what would. I mean, one, one of the most interesting things that you can watch is the uh, which they televised or at least partly, is the the meeting of the Russian National Security Council on the Monday, the whatever it was about the twenties or something like that of, of February, when he sort of called in the National Security Council, and that's the only people he meets. He never meets the government. Doesn't happen. And by the way, he has not met in person the National Security Council since that meeting. Every other meeting since then had been video. But he called them in and questioned them individually if they supported his policies. And most of them, at the end of this, they said, well, perhaps. But they all tried to wriggle out of it. Uh, there wasn't, with one exception, perhaps, anyone who showed anything, even remotely looking like enthusiasm for where they were heading. There was one person who was very close to him who explicitly said, this is wrong, there's going to be catastrophe, and he was cut out um, and hasn't been heard of since. Um, so so it, it was he him, himself who launched this particular war because he's been obsessed with the vision of restoring old Russia. And uh, he's obsessed with that he thinks he has the historical task of uh, conquering everything that uh, Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great and Catherine the Second had, and he can't contemplate a Russia that is smaller than that. But, but he's fairly alone in that. Otherwise, I mean, even Swedish can have nostalgic visions of what we did in the past, but, but we don't intend to conquer anyone. Please, Tobias. I, I don't have a real disagreement to Carl, so I totally agree that Putin is a lonely man. He's caring about his role and... Russia's role in, in, in history, while at the same time, you shouldn't be naive. The Russia after Putin most likely will not be better, most likely will not be easier. So, so the, the, the epochal swift, we call it Zeitenwende in Germany, so the epochal swift in our security policy that will sustain, it needs to sustain, because we cannot expect Russia to become a peaceful and responsible player on the international sphere. Russia has chosen sides with China, and I say this here in Israel, also with respect to Iran. They are giving something to Iran in, in regard to the delivery of drones, and this is something we all need to take care about, also for the time after the war. 
You want to add something? Yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe maybe a word on, on China, since we haven't uh, breached that subject. Uh, yet in this context. I, I think China, China has an interesting role to play here. China is a raising power, but uh, in order to sustain and, and build up this power, uh, I think you, you need to earn uh, a trust uh, with the international community and uh, with uh, your so-called uh, partners and clients. And how do you earn that trust is by uh, respecting certain common rules and, and uh, institutions. Uh? And uh, if you listen to, to Chinese uh, statements, um, they usually they have a, a reference to, to two principles. And those principles are territorial integrity and national uh, sovereignty. So if uh, China wants to earn the trust of the international community, they should also apply these principles in the context of, of Ukraine if they want to uh, become a credible uh, a mediator. I think that's a, a precondition for, for that. And what is interesting as well, I mean, you, you saw last week uh, during the G7 uh, summit, there was another summit, uh, a summit on Central, Central Asia, where China had convened uh, the, the leaders of uh, countries which are bordering Russia or very close to Russia, but not Russia. So I think uh, the a traditional sphere of, of influence uh, of, of Russia, the Ruski Mir, it is under you know, uh, uh, pressure to, to transform. We've got very little time, but I kind of, we can't not talk about Israel a little bit. So uh, any of you who want to weigh in, because um, you know, um, uh, how this conflict, how this war, um, has, has it impacted Europe's attitude to Israel in any way? Has it made Europe more conscious? Wow, actually, little countries can get, you know, roughed up terribly by aggressive neighbors. Has it promoted sympathy for Israel the other way around? Um, any, any or, or just irrelevant to the, to the discourse? Carl. I don't think it's had any sort of major impact. I mean, that there was, of course, an element of Israeli wavering. Uh, because a need uh, to mitigate security concerns across the northern border and so on, sure. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, but an element of wavering, uh, which led to question marks in Europe in the beginning, no question about that. And I, I think there's been an attempt by Israeli side to be somewhat, move somewhat on that particular issue. Um, but, um, and, and there was, of course, an Israeli attempt to do some mediating in the beginning that fell rather flat, rather fast, because there was no interest in that from, from the Russian side. But otherwise, I don't think there has been um, any impact that I'm aware of. I, I would almost share share this this assessment, but... Is that a diplomatic way of saying yeah, no, no, no. disagree? I'm, I'm, I just want to understand. I don't have any fundamental uh, disagreement, but... To, my, to, but be, to be as is in office, yeah. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know, I think every one of us has been several times to Kiev, and um, usually politicians don't are not used or not, not very often go into a shelter when there's air alerts. So maybe maybe if just one aspect, it gave you a little bit of understanding. You know, it's always comfortable in Europe. You're sitting in a nice chair in the evening, watching the TV news, and uh, you see rockets being fired on Israel. And to, to understand what it means to to shelter and to put your trust into the Iron Dome, into the air, air defense. Maybe it, it gives you a personal feeling what that means. And it makes you a little bit humble in terms of uh, giving advice from the sideline. I appreciate that. Thank you. Kai. No, not, not much to add. Uh, and uh, former prime minister, uh, politician in office, I'm a, I'm a diplomat, I'm a civil servant, so I, 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 I'm even more muted on, on a certain subject than my, my fellow speakers. But um, I think, um, you know, there, there's a lot you can, you can do um, even without uh, uh, compromising your, your, your own vital uh, interests. And uh, you, can, you can send messages, you can do strategic uh, communication, and uh, I think this... Uh, uh, rhetoric coming from from Russia about de-nazifying uh, 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 Ukraine is, is definitely something uh, you can you can counter uh, with your own messaging. Yeah.
So I'm a journalist and I have no obligations to anybody, which is wonderful. I, I would just say, and hey, I get the last word because we're out of time. Um, in terms of Israeli public opinion, I don't think any, any wavering. I think a great sense of identification, not only because Zelensky happens to be Jewish, but because of what I said, a little country uh, um, and, the, and the people next door, you know, barreling in. Uh, I think I know where the Israeli public stands. We're out of time. I thought this was fascinating. Thank you to our three panelists. And see you again, I hope. Thank you very much. Thank you.